and now we're locked in. So this talk is going to be in English or Norwegian. I can do Norwegian. We can do Norwegian. I can't. Um, so this is the, the last BSD talk. <laughs> Ever. Ever. <laughs> Even though it's free BSD, but still, it's, it's part of the family. Um, I've been at the same conference as Eric's been uh, two years ago at EuroBSD. I missed your talk. Uh, last year, I was not there. I missed your talk, so I'm very happy that you're here. <laughs> um, so I know <coughs> Eric from uh, sponsoring that he's been doing for EuroBSD. Again, thank you. Um, and apparently a very good talk that, he, that you've done two years ago okay. with the DDoS stuff. So, uh, um, but thanks that you're here. So give it up for Eric. Hello, everyone. Um, very quickly, I am Eric Overby. I'm from a company called Modern. We're based in a number of places, but I'm in Norway. Um, I'll cover a little bit about what we're doing. Um, I am here because I've been using FreeBSD since about 2000. It's a bit hard to nail it down exactly when that happened. I really love open source. I think that happened long before I realized that it happened. Um, in 2003, I suddenly found myself in the payment industry. That was um, confusing for a long time. Very steep learning curve. And I'm, it's, it's rare to hear people talk about um, DDoS attacks having been victims of them uh, because it tends to come with a bit of you know, stigma. Maybe people lose trust in you if you talk about it too much. Um, unless, of course, it's a su success story, which in our case it isn't. Uh, I cannot claim that our story with DDoSes has any measure of success. You can only hope to survive it most of the time. We, as in Modrum, now there's only uh, Valentina here from Modrum, but uh, we have been doing in-house developed software hosted on FreeBSD since 2003. When I entered the, um, the payment industry, I was asked if I know about FreeBSD, if I've heard about jails. I had more or less literally just started playing with jails, the virtual machines, the containers on FreeBSD. And it was a stroke of luck that brought me to that point. We perform authentications when you pay online. So if your bank has an agreement with us or a company like ours, we will be doing the authentication when you pay online on the internet. So we're kind of the, we're the man in the middle. You know, that nobody wants to have anything to do with. We create this software for ourselves and for banks, card issuers, that sort of thing, for merchants, uh, payment processors. You have Amazon, PayPal, all these companies. They all have to integrate with this ecosystem in some way or another. And a few years ago, back in 2000. 2021, 20, we suddenly found ourselves with a huge target painted on our backs. I'll get back to that. A little bit of a throwback to another talk I've done that probably nobody here saw, but it paints a picture of the industry we're in. Um, there are basically three major players. We have those who write the requirements that we're under. That would be security requirements and that sort of thing. Uh, th then you have those who are covering their asses. That would be pretty much everyone. And then it's those who are blamed in the end. And that would be us. <coughs> That's our job. That's what we paid for. Um, speaking of requirements, we have a whole bunch of them that apply to us. We have PCI DSS, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. There's a subset of that called the 3DS or superset, actually. That just makes our job much harder. Um, you have requirements from payment systems like Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and all the others. And then you have the legal requirements, the national requirements, European requirements, the PSD2, the GDPR, local law, whatever the customers ask us to do, all these things. And some of these requirements come with some pretty interesting 
side effects, like you have auditors who ask us to take pictures of the password files on our systems uh, in the data center. <laughs> we were asked to document that grep supports regular expressions because we were using it to look for card data in our logs. We had just asked for an auditor who knows Unix, by the way. We have an auditor storing evidence collected during an audit on his Windows XP laptop. The same laptop he uses for his adult entertainment, which was gloriously revealed to us. Oh, and yeah, your root accounts must have a strong password under split knowledge and dual control. So basically long password, split it in two, hang it on dif two different pin boards. That's fine. Disabling your root account is not fine because that's not what the book says. So like a colleague of mine said, it's like you have a solid brick wall and what they're asking you to do is knock a hole in it, put in a door and a bunch of really good locks. That's somehow preferable. Anyway, that's the absurdity of the business. So this is how the blame game continues. I wanna cover the anatomy of a denial of service, distributed denial of service attack. Talk a little bit about the personal cost because at the end of the day, that's why I'm here, especially for a small organization. We're just a handful of people dealing with this. I'll say a little bit about the defenses we have in place that do work, at least they do help and a little bit about the lessons we have learned along the way. And feel free to interrupt with questions if you have any. There might be some details that are FreeBSD or at least BSD specific, shouldn't be a lot. I think I managed to weed out most of it. It started quiet. Most merchants, they use this 3D secure that we do because it means they experience less loss from fraud. And that's where we end up in the middle. We perform no authentication. The banks, they go ahead and they buy this service from us so that they can authenticate their cardholders. So when you get a card from your bank, the bank probably knows something about you. They might have your phone number. So they might be able to, for example, send you an OTP via, via SMS. That's how it started for many of them. Or you have passwords or some other mechanism. Then you have some merchants out there who really don't care about fraud because they're not gonna, they don't lose anything. They sell Bitcoin or they sell stolen SIM cards or they sell access to porn sites or whatever it is. They don't care whose card you're using. So they, don't, they are not interested in 3D Secure. They, as long as they get money, they're fine. And the banks, they quietly pay you back because they don't want uh, the drama, they don't want the card payments to have a bad reputation because if you start losing money, then you're going to tell your friends and people are going to stop trusting cards as if they ever did. And of course, if the authentication solutions you, pu you, you put in place should fail for some reason, then you have backup solutions. Like when you go to the shop and, it and you use your physical card and it takes forever to pay, it's because the online authorization system doesn't work but they let you pay anyway. They just skip a bunch of the checks. So they can deal with the fallout later. So if the authentication is broken, we skip it. Now that's key, remember that. And then we got the PSD2, the Payment Services Directive 2, which requires authentication for, for all internet payments for card holders and cards issued in Europe. So all those merchants who don't care where the money comes from, they suddenly need to implement support for this or the banks will simply refuse to transfer money. Especially those who don't care where the money comes from. And that pisses off the bad guys because you can't even buy crypto with stolen cards anymore. Because all of a sudden you need to authenticate. And let's kick this uh, authentication server over and see what happens. And that's where the first wave comes in. March 2021, we had no idea this was gonna come. We were unprepared. We thought we had good systems. We thought we had decent internet. You know, we had no problem handling, handling loads. We'd seen a couple of Black Fridays come and go with no issue. We were pretty confident. Normally, and this is, this is laughable, even today we're at maybe 50 megabits inbound traffic. Um, 
and we handle a billion transactions a year. The reason is simple, we don't stream video. We receive small requests from web browsers, we present some simple HTML, and other than that, other than that we pass messages between systems. It's really nice and efficient, it's usually compressed, so inbound traffic is pretty low. Wartime traffic in the first, during the very first attack, I mean, there are so many extra zeros here, you know? So uh, 10 gigabits inbound, a million packets per second seen by our internet service provider, and they have fatter pipes than us, so by the time it makes it to our puny little gigabit link, it's down to 200,000 packets per second, but that's still a lot, especially when you're not prepared for it. It was run-of-the-mill stuff, you know, you throw a bunch of UDP, some TCP SYN spoofing, some ICMP, other garbage traffic. Um, costs almost nothing to produce, you can use reflection and all sorts of things, you can use the internet to amplify the attack for you. And you get it for free. Because the guys who do this for you, the owners of the botnets, they're selling this as a service. And they have to advertise their service, so they give you, your, your first attack is free. Your first five or ten minutes, you get it for free. See what our platform can do, see what our botnet can do. So we were stunned, we were off the net for minutes, tens of minutes, hours at a time, which is unheard of for us. The backup solutions, when our system doesn't work, and the banks and the payment systems still allow the payments to go through. That is the target I mentioned that was painted on our backs. You debrick the cards, you make them work anyway. The ISPs had DDoS protection systems in place, but they were mostly symbolic, um, out of the box config, which is tuned for absolutely nothing. Three years old code, they upgraded it in the middle of one of our attack waves but they didn't enable it for us. They, it turned out to be disabled for us because why not? And the secondary ISP, well, they black holed us in self-defense <laughs> and we couldn't reach them. So um, it sounds fun, but it wasn't really. So that's me. Calling our ISP, asking them for help begging for help, it was bad. I mean, the anti-DDoS solution that they offered was priced at like 20 times what we, what we normally paid them for service. So the real costs of this, humans don't scale, especially not individuals. When you have a nine to five job, or maybe it's five to midnight, whatever it is, you're sort of spent. And when you have this sort of thing happening, taking hours of your time, day after day after night after night after night, you burn out in days. Not weeks or months, in days. And not being able to sleep, come on, we've all done that. We've all pulled all-nighters, right? Uh, it, you can recover, especially you know, if you're a bit younger, you can recover more easily. So that's only part of the problem it feels really personal because it keeps happening over and over and over again. You grow anxiety, uh, anxious, you develop anxiety, uh, you have birth, birthdays, your own, your partner, your spouse, your kids, family. Families are suffering because they see you and they don't get your attention. And in a way, all of this is the price of doing a lot with very little and have very few people it's one of the nice things with FreeBSD and other open source platforms. You can do stuff that other people buy a whole data center to do with half a rack of equipment, with correspondingly few people. But that means when something like this hits, those three, four, five people, they're all you got. But that was just the first round. So let's um, up the game, shall we? I was later that year. Um, depends a bit how you define the wave. The question was how, how long the first wave went on. Well, it never really stopped. You would have an attack. Attacks were usually for five or ten minutes at a time. 
maybe had a few in a day, and then it would be quiet for a couple of days, and then it would hit again. I'll pause and explain one thing that we have learned later. Um, turns out that, you know when you go to a hotel and you have these piles of receipts with card numbers printed on them? I, or you break into some system, you hear about it on the internet that someone broke into someone's system target or whatever, got a bunch of card numbers. Well, you need a way to use them. So you kick our system over, you use the stolen cards, and then you move on. So if you have five cards, you only need five minutes. So you can use these free attacks, you know, and but you can do it again and again and again. Um, it was quiet during July of that year because these guys are professionals. This is their job. And we can tell from when in the day in which time zone they're working because that's when the attacks come in and it moves around a bit. If it's European attackers, it's usually our office hours or it's very early morning because they know that's when they can hurt us. But July, quiet. But then that when the attacks started again, they had changed tactics a bit. First of all, we suddenly started seeing full TCP handshakes and even some full TLS in there. And that's a lot harder to deal with because you can't just drop spoof traffic. You can't just drop the SYN floods or whatever it is. You actually need to do the TCP handshake. You know the attacking bot is actually a real machine. Um, they were basically trace routing us finding out that, oh, that's your ISP. Well, we remember once upon a time they were friends with that ISP over there, so let's see what happens if we try to spoof IPs in their network block. Maybe we can bypass your DDoS filter. Yes, they could. And we got past 100 gigabit and 10 million packets per second mark, which is when even, I don't know if anyone heard about Arbor, they do DDoS protection for ISP level and stuff like that. That's when they just cut off and said, this is, you haven't paid for protection for bigger attacks than this. And from implementing a countermeasure that works until they found a way around it took a few days at this point. So you could at least sleep, right? Catch some sleep. Um, so at this point, we've learned that the attacks must be profitable because the moment you start doing full-blown TCP handshakes, it's no longer a reflection attack. You actually have to own the hardware yourself or you have to control real hardware. You can't just bounce off of others. They go on holidays. So yes, they're professionals. And we don't receive any ransom notes. We never have, neither have our customers because there's no need. They get their payout right away. They use stolen cards they get what they pay for immediately. There's no need to threat, threaten anyone. So everyone else who gets a DDoS attack thrown at them, they will get a ransom note. We've never seen one. But we also know that by this time, the attacks has to cost. They have to cost a little bit. I mean, they, they are not free anymore. This is no longer your free uh, trial runs. And we need to get better at this point because we're still catching up and we're still very far behind. Um, and the way to do that is to make the attacks more expensive. But you know, the other guys, they have probably more people, cheaper people, fatter internet pipes than we do, at least combined. So but in October of 21, it gets really, really personal. We have good DDoS mitigation, at least that's what we feel. But the attackers, they now go all in. Um, they don't really do UDP, ICMP, SYN floods anymore. Now it's full TLS. Their bots, they have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of bots that do full TLS negotiations with our systems to the point where we can't mitigate until we spend time on RSA or elliptic curve handshakes, which means we blow our CPUs out of the water. They start understanding how our application works. They know which parts of our application we can rate limit and filter and which parts they, that we cannot. So they start developing custom layer seven attack tooling for this specific purpose. At this point, from implementing a countermeasure, whether it's an Nginx configuration or some network layer stuff until it's bypassed, it's five minutes, which means I've sat there for six hours straight, we had a six hour long DDoS attack. 
I probably made a hundred configuration changes during that time, and they just followed up, they modified their attack to bypass the filtering in minutes. And that is exhausting. Mentally, physically, it's absolutely devastating for anyone involved. Months on end, this was going on. And this is the requirement that we're under. We are required to withstand denial of service attacks that could force fallback, that would be the back, backup solution, to less secure verification methods or provide cover for other attacks. It is, it is so vague, I don't even know where to begin. So this is why I call it a blame game, because the requirements are vague, which makes it very easy to blame us. They will definitely be read differently by those who blame. It is very hard to work from under the bus. I mean, face it, we had the target paint on our backs, we were thrown under the bus, and we're expected to fix it. Because the loss that the banks have or experience from the fraud that happens during the DDoS attacks is nothing compared to what they would lose if shopping would stop for those 10 minutes or that hour. So of course they have no interest in disabling the backup solutions. They're still there. And something that we've had to repeat time and time again, as long as we are reasonably prepared, I've done steps to actually shore up against this. I don't accept it when someone, when my customer tells me that I need to report on this incident. I don't agree with the word incident because an incident implies we haven't done our job. In this case, it's a force majeure. That's the only way you can look at it. But we've done some things that at least help. Yes, the bartender told us this. Um, uh, spoiler alert, we don't really. Uh, we'll get back to that. Uh, but we had to upgrade our hardware. So we replaced the routers. We took control of everything ourselves instead of depending on external parties, ISPs, whatever. We do all this stuff ourselves now. 10 gigabits everywhere on routers, firewalls, multiple upstreams. We had two ISPs before, one gig each, and it was a horrible setup. Now we have, I think, three ISPs, each of them with double 10 gig pipes, et cetera, et cetera, distributed traffic and so on. That helps. Uh, this is a bit BSD specific. Um, there's the concept of syn cookies that have been immensely helpful to us. I mean, kernel level, you have that in Linux, FreeBSD, everywhere. You had that for many, many years. It basically means when you have too many incoming TCP syns, your kernel will, instead of passing that to the application, will respond back to the connecting client with what it calls a cookie, content, which is a payload in the SYNAC packet that allows uh, the third part of the handshake to actually create the full handshake in the kernel without ever talking to the application. It's, uh, some of you will know this. Doing this on the firewall level, as in packet filter, PF, instead of doing it in the kernel, allows a lot more granularity and allows us to do things much smarter and faster. So that had a huge effect on any smokescreen attack that would just try to uh, um, exhaust our states, state tables in firewalls, state tables on the application side, etc. Uh, also, what we found out is that most defaults in operating system kernels, in PF, in network configuration, they're from the modem era. I mean, defaults waiting for a minute for a TCP handshake to, to complete, come on, nobody does that. Nobody has that patience, and you're just eating up resources in the process. And you don't need to keep your states around. When the connection is closed, erase it from your table, so just get rid of it. And FreeBSD is specific again, once we get in uh, network stacks in each jail, each virtual machine, we can start setting these limits 
for each application instance instead of system-wide. Also something that helped a lot. Then of course we can hack our web server config. Make sure you use your hardware. Uh, especially when you do TLS proxying with Nginx, you will have most of your CPU time is spent on TLS because it doesn't do very much else. Rate limiting, a lot of people do rate limiting, but you need to do that for each resource type you have, whether it's a static, uh, the JavaScript file, or it's images, or it's actual dynamic content. Stick identifiers in your request so that you can actually do rate limiting without having to look at the source IP, that sort of thing. And again, timeouts, more defaults from the modem era. Um, and then you have this statement in Nginx, which is absolutely fantastic. If you hit a situation where you know you're not supposed to reach this point, you're not supposed to access this resource, or you have passed your rate limiting limits, then that one simply drops the entire TCP socket on the floor. It just instantly drops everything. There goes a reset packet, and that's it. The socket is closed. All the operating system resources are released. Uh, web server resources are released, everything is good. That will save you more times than it won't. Especially if people are triggering 400 type errors. And of course, you need to be really uh, specific about your location statements. This is Nginx specific, of course, but you need to understand how your application works. And that can sometimes be harder than you think. And separate monitoring from application. You need to monitor your Nginx, you need to monitor the Tomcat or whatever it is behind it, but make sure that an, uh, a resource exhaustion attack doesn't prevent you from seeing what's going on. But the big one that we did in the end, we went to Cloudflare. Everyone said use the cloud. Um, by that they usually mean throw your TLS into the cloud. Have some cloud service do your TLS handshakes for you. There's a number of reasons we can't do that, but Magic Transit, I know there's other similar services. Basically, they become you on the internet. All inbound traffic to your network goes through Cloudflare. They have their points of presence all over the world. From their, from their data centers around the world, you have GRE tunnels to your local routers. That's what we do. So we have I don't remember how many GRE tunnels to their few hundred net, um, data centers around the globe. So it ingests the traffic, they analyze it, they filter shape, they know about botnets, you know, that sort of thing, so they can filter things that we could never dream of, and it happens very near the source, which means it never reaches our network. Our transit providers, our you know, ISPs of, of old, they only see this GRE traffic. They don't actually see anything else, so they don't need to have their own DDoS protection mechanisms in place anymore. They weren't working very well by now anyway. And it means we can use the cloud, but we don't have to do TLS in the cloud, which means we don't need to give our TLS keys to anyone else. But it isn't God mode. I don't know if you noticed near the top here, I'm doing some Doom references. Um, what they do is effectively DDoS mitigation on layer three and layer four. I don't know if anyone used gray listing with email before. Uh, basically, you, you, you defer the first attempt at delivery to see if the other end will try again. That's an indication that the other end is actually a proper mail transfer agent and not just someone who's throwing garbage. We do the same with TCP or Cloudflare does. They sabotage the, TSA, TLA, uh, the TCP handshake to see if the connecting client will do the right thing and retransmit, for example, or react to broken responses or whatever. This assumes that the attackers are poor and or stupid, and the bots are stupid, as in not implementing a proper TCP stack. Sadly, that's not the case, but it still helps a lot and it only works when you're the only game in town because Ricochet is a killer. What happens is, actually I should go back to that one and explain a little bit more. 
Um, when your ISP sees an attack going on hitting our network and you're trying to pay and authenticate at the same time, your ISP is going to be mitigating as well and they're going to use much the same technique. So imagine two sides of a TCP connection both trying to challenge the other, both trying to sabotage the other to see if the other behaves. There are so many ways in which this can go wrong. So again, ricochet. So we get Cloudflare in place. It's been quiet for a long time, but this year we had one of these. That's 350 million packets per second. That's the kind of thing that makes Cloudflare sit up and pay attention. At the same time, we saw more than a terabit of inbound attack traffic. Most of it luckily mitigated by Cloudflare, but even, in, even if 0.1% or 0.01% of this gets through, it's still going to flatten you because that's still a lot of traffic. And it's, this is all attempted TCP handshakes. This is not spoof traffic. So I don't even want to know what this costs the attackers. <laughs> they were. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> obviously, I made it more expensive, but you know, not expensive enough apparently. So yeah, attacks in the terabyte scale and 100 million packets and more. These are surgical strikes. They know exactly what, how to hurt us. They know exactly how to get past the filters. They also know about the side effects that I just mentioned because they know what we can't do anything about. And the side effects are horrible because all these bots, they live in all the different networks all over the place, whether you're in, in, in some Dutch uh, uh, cell phone provider, they're going to have bots in their network without knowing, but they will see the traffic when it happens, right? Or you have people, they, they're renting compute in Google, uh, from Google, from Amazon, from Azure. We had to block AS, so ASs, so entire networks, AWS, Google, and Azure are all blocked most of the time because we know that cardholders, people like yourselves, usually don't shop from an Amazon data center. But we can have as much as 30% of that track traffic coming from, I don't know, 80,000 Amazon IPs. So that can't be free. And if it is, it's broken. It would help a little. No, but, it's, but they're mm. probably paying the servers with the attack. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe they're using stolen cards to pay AWS bills. <laughs> That's precisely what's going on. So of course your ISP is going to go into self-defense mode and start mitigating as well. So even though our systems are fine, you guys are going to suffer because your ISP won't let you reach us because Cloudflare is also challenging you and it's a, it's a shit show. Um, I get this question all the time. When do you plan to solve this? Because we can't. I mean, turn off your backup solution. And why not layer seven in the cloud? Which a lot of people think would just solve the problem. Um, GDPR, decrypting sensitive data in the cloud. I don't know if you would want that with your personal data, uh, especially when you're doing payments. This is a really difficult one to crack. There's also technical reasons. We integrate with authentication solutions in various countries. In Norway, we have our national thing called Bank ID. You have the same in Sweden, different technology. You have um, a Finnish trust network in Finland. I don't know what you have in Holland, um, if there's anything, but many of these platforms, they make assumptions about static IP addresses and that sort of thing, or that the request has to start and finish in the same place. It makes using layer seven in the cloud really, really hard. And I'm not sure it would help all that much because even Cloudflare or AWS or Azure, they're gonna have their own DDoS mitigation service in front of their own layer seven proxies, which means when they are under attack, we're gonna have the same interference. We're gonna have the same side effects. And by now, those are the ones that really hurt us because even a full-blown attack against us if anything, it takes down one system. We have 
what, 15 different customer systems. Uh, so uh, we can deal with that. We can tell that customer, you were under attack. They used this card or these sets of cards or this transaction at this merchant as the starting point. And the customer that is actually being attacked directly, they're happy to be told because then they can do something about it. But it's all the other customers who suffer from the side effects, they complain. And this is gonna happen even if we move this to the cloud. And it might protect that single system that is actually directly under attack, but it won't prevent the side effects. So even if we could solve the first two, I'm not sure it's gonna solve any of the rest. We got some more helpful suggestions. This is from last week, and I thought, hey, great, some comic relief for my, my talk. <laughs> Get more hardware, yeah, sure. We already do 100,000 TLS handshakes per second on existing hardware. And I've been checking with Intel, they have this uh, hardware accelerated TLS. Um, that doesn't help, it does a lot less than this. So if we get 100,000 uh, connections that we handle and Cloudflare is dropping more than a million per second, how much more hardware are we gonna need to handle it? Who's gonna pay for that? That's not happening. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> and steal some cards and pay for it that way. Yeah, accelerate your TLS. Um, most of the hardware offered for that purpose are for systems that are otherwise weak, low core count. Intel's own, uh, Intel's own hardware for that, they say themselves it tops out at around 12 cores. If you have 12 Xeon cores in your system, it's gonna be better to use your CPU than to use their accelerated card. So I don't know, we have what, 64 cores in our servers? times however many servers. Oh, and this, this is my favorite. Use proprietary TLS because open source is vulnerable. Don't get me started. <laughs> I'm having a call with that client about this particular statement next week. I, <laughs> yeah. So what have we learned? Obviously, it's been a while since every sysadmin in the world knew each other. Sorry, you had a question? No, this is, I, um, let me see if I understood the question correctly. Um, whether it would help to basically black box the authentication and separate it from the payment protocol? Yeah, yeah, All right, so you do the authentication at the merchant, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, the whole idea about 3D Secure, which this protocol is called, is that you have three separate security domains. You have the issuer domain, which is your bank and yourself. Uh, you are the cardholder and you presumably trust your bank more than you trust anyone else in this ecosystem. Um, then you have the you know, Visa, MasterCard, Diners, whoever it is in the middle, that's a separate security domain. And then you have the merchant side, which is entirely untrusted. In this model, the merchant side, so the web shop payment platform, never speaks directly to your bank during the authentication process. Any communication is either passed through the payment system, so Visa or MasterCard, or through your browser, because that's the only link that you can sort of trust. So they have to be decoupled. And this is also why it's so easy to go after, authentic after the authentication server, because it doesn't actually hurt the merchant. That's why when the merchant tries to use this system and our system fails, then it will just try to use that other system that Visa or the bank offers. And that system is, again, in a different place and therefore not under attack. So, in principle, the model is sound, but the, in reality, because they don't trust their own platform, and therefore they implement the backup solutions, it can fall apart like this.
so the point of the backup solution uh, and why it cannot be as good as what we offer is that the backup solution sits elsewhere and has access to none of the information that we do. I mean, I get information from your bank about how to authenticate you. I get, for example, your phone number or your SSN. I have an integration with, uh, with some authentication platform that your bank trusts. But the backup solution, the what we call the attempts system, sits at MasterCard in the US, for example, at uh, Discover or wherever it is. The only thing that one does is just say, yeah, it was a valid attempt. But it has no information about you or anyone else. It doesn't know, it doesn't know anything about the bank. This is a um, backup system that the actual pay the payment systems, Visa and MasterCard, offer to all their banks, but they have no custom configuration. If that system is being used, the only safety measure in place at that point is, are you suddenly spending tens of thousands of dollars in Dubai? It will probably stop that, but not even that always. But for buying Bitcoins or whatever, they're not gonna do anything. Five minutes, I'm basically done. So, sysadmins don't know each other anymore. It's a very unfriendly place out there. And this sort of attack, they expose the bus factor in a company in spectacular ways. And you cannot fight it alone, especially if you're a small company. You need outside help. And any piece is temporary. That's what we found. Earlier this year, we had probably four or five months with nearly no attacks at all, the attacks are, attackers were simply regrouping. That's why when they hit us again, it was several times heftier than before. And the best defense, as always, make the attacks more expensive. Uh, yes, it escalates the situation, but at least you can hope it doesn't happen quite as often. And don't be afraid of violating some standards. You don't have to reply 418, I'm a teapot, just <laughs> because it's fun. The triple four is gonna do just fine, nobody cares. So, that was it. Uh, I normally thank contributors, I think this room is full of them. Uh, without the open source uh, ecosystem, we would never get anywhere in all this. I don't wanna know what we would have to pay commercial vendors for many of the things we do. Uh, this event is great. Thank you for inviting me. And thanks to everyone else who makes the communities tick, the ones that we depend on. And until next time.